<laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about teaching, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so hopefully these are kind of questions we want to answer as teachers. Hopefully you know the answer to that, right? 100% so far. If you answered no, then you get zero points, right? Uh, how, are you re how are residents doing as teachers? So we like to do a yearly sort of evaluation. I don't know if you know this, but you are evaluated by the students. It's required now. So if you teach Creighton students, they evaluate you. And, and that goes into a little report at the end of the year, and we send it to your program director. So Mike, do we send Do you get a copy of that? Yes, sir. Excellent. We are 100% right now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, we, we, uh, we'll just take that as 100% compliance here. We, uh, uh, that, was a, that was a perfect answer, Mike. Thanks. Uh, and then finally, how, how can we improve? If there's any room for improvement, and there always is, right? How can we uh, improve? So let's see. I was going to do this interactive, but it, it, you know, like security wouldn't allow the little jump drive. So uh, what, let's see. Teaching students is one of my primary roles as a resident. Who falls? How many would say that's true? My primary responsibility. How many would say false? That's not one of my primary. Like, well, excellent. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, 100%. So what, I don't know what you got over at St. Joe's, but over at Maricopa, wait a minute. Is it Valley Wise now? Um, <laughs> is it okay? But is it Valley Wise Hospital? Yeah. Valley Wise Medical Center. Valley Wise Medical Center. Center. Yeah, you I will try. Right. Valley Wise Health Medical Center. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Any jump knows? <laughs> you guys all. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, anywhere from twenty to sixty percent of teaching of medical students comes from residents. I don't think that does that come to a surprise as a surprise to any of you? Seems low. Who said low? Yeah. Seems kind of low. Uh, and I think I think that's right. I, I, you know, when I was a medical student, our residents were our best teachers, really, often. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to you, hopefully, that residents, whether our students, get a lot of their teaching that comes from uh, residents. Um, direct correlation, student happiness on our rotation, the amount of resident teaching. Why do you think that is? Do you got any thoughts about why it is that uh, residents tend to be some of the better teachers for students? Yeah, James, what do you think? You're super, you don't know what you're doing, you're happy if you're like not useful, and test, test, test. Scared, you know? So to have a resident who's not like as intimidating as attending, like talk to you or teach you or show you, I mean, just make you. I like that intimidation factor, maybe less. Test, the, test, test. Thoughts on why residents uh, sometimes are better teachers? Yeah. Uh, you're somewhat detached from the attending. I mean, you don't see your attending very often, I feel like, as a medical student, but you're with your residents all the time. And if your resident isn't teaching you, that's a good portion of the day that you're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I, I think most of the, for sure, clinical uh, residents, you know, which are medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, that's probably true. They probably assign you a student. You're with that student the whole day. You, the attending maybe comes in and out. Radiology, that's the same way it works with us anyway. I assign them with the resident and then they look at the exam and then we come check them out together. So I don't see the student all day long, but the resident does. So I, yeah, that's a great point. Um, any other thoughts on why residents are, yes? We were just recently a medical student. Yeah, I, I think there's something to that. I, I really think you learn most from the person that's one step ahead of you, you know, because they know relevant stuff. Maybe it seems unimportant to the attending, all the little details of how to function, but to the person who's just behind you, it's really important stuff. And I, I think that's absolutely true. Excellent. Those are the points I was hoping you would make. Let's see, uh, resident fears regarding teaching. teaching. I, th I think there are some fears out there. Um, I don't really feel smart enough to teach maybe, um, but studies show that residents teach students that, that what residents teach students is a much higher yield than what the attending teaches. Nice to know versus uh, need to know. And I like to do this, you know, if you're, let's see, what should you first read for radiology residency for chest? Would you rather have the chest radiology residence manual or some obscure book that some guy wrote because he was uh, uh, wanting to impress people? I don't know. You know <laughs> but, but you get the idea, right? Nice to know versus need to know. Um, okay. Do you know the questions students are asked to evaluate, evaluate you as teachers? How many, how many know what questions are being asked? 
the student? What, is, what are they being asked about you? Anybody know? We probably have some guesses, right? But, but you haven't, okay. So we have some work to do there to make sure, and that's what one of the purposes here is. What are they evaluating you on? What, what are they being asked about you? And so it's one of the things we're going to do. So here's the questions that they ask about you. So the, uh, this resident provided me with timely and constructive feedback. This resident promoted independent learning. This resident encouraged me to participate actively in patient care. This resident modeled effective patient care. This resident promoted a positive and constructive learning environment. And overall, this resident was an effective teacher. So you've seen it now, right? You at least read, read through it briefly. Let's, let's go over these things a little bit. So how are we doing? Uh, so these are kind of our numbers from this last year. Uh, you can see on that first one, timely and constructive feedback, pretty good. Uh, looks like uh, family medicine is the big winner this year on uh, how they did with, the, with that, but everybody did relatively well. Um, but that's the kind of thing you'll get a detailed report on yourself on how you did. Um, and, and if you're in, obviously for radiology, you, you may not be evaluated by the student, although they should. Um, but for the core clerkships, it's required. So if you're in a core clerkship area, department, you will get an evaluation. So uh, why do students often report feedback when you know you provided feedback? This is really common. So <laughs> James, what do you think? Um, maybe they, if it's negative, they, <laughs> or like you don't tell them directly like I'm giving you feedback <laughs> yeah that, that's the two great thoughts any other reasons why I mean I put it I put some there uh, any other thoughts on why students don't remember that you gave them feedback well you yourself uh, why might you forget that somebody gave you feedback I don't know you know, maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. So maybe the fact is that they didn't. Okay, that that's that's a possibility, right? We had another thought over there. There's a lot going on. Poor timing. You know, maybe the thoughts are somewhere else. I don't know, that's that's reasonable. I think uh, James kind of suggested that a little bit. If it's negative, maybe just block it out. Uh, maybe you got other things going on in your life. You don't don't want to hear it. Uh, yeah. Too, too generic for like you're doing your good job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so maybe that's the perception is uh, I gave them feedback. I told them they're doing great. And, and the student doesn't see that as feedback. And arguably it's not right. Um, it's not a detailed evaluation of how the student's doing. Right. So to your point, maybe they really did. You know, <laughs> so I, I think that's those are all good points. And, and but just something to think about that we want to get used to regularly giving our student feedback. Hey, you're doing great for this beat. And okay, we'll talk more about how to get feedback, right? Uh, the reality learners may not recognize feedback. You'll likely need to tell them that you're giving them feedback for them to uh, realize. So what is feedback? Is it encouragement, praise and compliments, subjective, objective? What, what would you say? Uh, how about votes for objective? Feedback is objective. Feedback is subjective. It was split last time between those two. Uh, you know, encouragement may be seen as encouragement. I think that was sort of an antiquated view of feedback as a way to encourage people. Um, and praise and compliments, hopefully that's not what it is, right? But this idea of is it subjective or objective, um, why, why do you think it's subjective? What objective measures are you using to evaluate? The okay, so, so, so what's your method for evaluating me? If you're just saying, hey, you did a crappy job, well, that's not very objective, is it? That's sort of your opinion, it's very subjective. So, so yes, All right, did you tell me what you're gonna evaluate me on? And then did you, did you actually use those parameters to evaluate me? So we would like it to be objective, but unfortunately it's often very subjective. And so I think that's why it's split here is that I think it's probably the evaluator's fault, right? That, that, that you guys are so split on that because hopefully it is more objective. Um, let's see, so. Information describing students or house officers for the given activities and blah, blah, blah. Feedback is not praise, compliments, encouragement, evaluation. Uh, feedback should not be subjective, but as to your points this year and years before, it often is subjective. And feedback is formative assessment and objective appraisal of performance. Um, 
So, you know, and I think, how, how do you go about doing this as a resident? Seems awkward, seems like more something that should come from an attending. Do you guys feel comfortable doing this or is this very awkward to try and give a student feedback? I'm mean, gonna say it's awkward. Nobody thinks it's awkward. Yeah. yeah. In radiology, it's not, like we don't expect the student be able to understand anything we're doing yet because it's, you know, you're two years in before you can start you know, understanding the material. So it's hard to say how they're doing is they, they can't make a product. They can't, it's not like they can write a note and we can evaluate them or you can see their physical exam. What do you think of this question? And, and I love your point here. Um, and we'll get to it in a minute. Any other thoughts on why? It, it, let's see, do people feel like it's, it, you do feel comfortable giving feedback? So we had some nods of the head here. Why do you feel comfortable doing it and some people, others don't? watching um, our students go to the ITP and then report back. So there's plenty of examples to use, and I think that that's where the objective part comes in. So you have to have an actual example of what they've done to say whether or not this was, you know, appropriate or not appropriate. So we got radiology versus OBGYN, and the big difference is you understand what the student is supposed to get out of the rotation beforehand, right? And in radiology, we may or may not have defined that. Does that make it hard to give feedback to somebody? Yeah, just to, and to your point before, is it subjective or objective? Well, did you tell me what you're gonna evaluate me on before? And I think that is one of the, our responsibilities as program directors, as leadership, is to make sure residents who are doing a lot of the teaching know what the student is supposed to get out of the rotation. So how many know what the goals and objectives of the rotation for your student are? By raise of hand. Oh, so we've got some people. A little bit back here. I mean, you, you described some of them back here. What, where are you from? Surgery. Surgery. So surgery, excellent. Liz has done a good job uh, helping you guys understand what the goals and objectives of the surgery rotation is. Anybody else ever seen goals and objectives of the rotations? Yeah, we have them on the papers. We go over some of them on the ground. We're like, okay, what? Hey, this is a feedback paper I'm going to need at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Like, hold on to it and give it back to me once we're done with the rotation together. So Good. we kind of know what to look out for, what kinds of things, like, well, if we have to go over, like, three or four different topics together, and you can teach me on those, so we can see, like, how far you've come, like, what you know about. Perfect. So, yeah. So, so for people who aren't giving feedback, how, how could you go about making it so it, it was a routine part of whatever day or week or month? What could you do? Feedback Fridays. Feedback Fridays. Make it routine. Make it routine. I, I think that's right. I think make it a routine part of what's going to happen during the week. But just just to your point and a couple of people's points, let them know at the beginning of the week that it's going to happen, right? Uh, so that they can be ready for it, and and I think it'll be well received that way. Um, so something we can work on. Uh, I love that you guys do know some of the, the of goals and objectives but other places maybe not so much that we can, we can work on those. Okay, uh, resident, let's see, promoted independent learning. That seems tough. Let's see who did well. Pete's, oh, of course, Pete's, they're the best. Um, let's see, how can you encourage independent learning? What do you think, model your own way for them, ask them to read, <laughs> which I put that in there, who laughed? <laughs> I, I, that is one of the most common and most frustrating comments for students. That you need to read more. You know, well, yeah, that, that's it. It's kind of cliche almost, isn't it? Uh, ask them to reflect on the process. We are a Jesuit institution, right? Reflection is part of what we do. Uh, assign tasks and follow up on them. Okay, I like all those, except for the read more thing. I mean, be specific about it, follow up on it. Maybe that's your okay. All right. So independent learning, how do you encourage, let's, let's just talk about it. How do, you, how do you encourage independent learning in a student? Yes. I think one good thing is to give them some time to work on like their review world questions or whatever they're already doing to study for the shelf or step, step two, whatever they have going on because they're gonna do that anyways. And I feel like if you give them a specific article to read, it may not be something that they're that interested in, they're gonna read it and I don't think they're gonna yeah, but independent learning should be independent, shouldn't it? It should be something that they choose what they're interested in, learn about it, and then have a way maybe to follow up on, on what they learn, okay? 
Other ways you can encourage independent learning? Yes. I think you should assign them like to read up on questions of the patients if they're taking care of complex patients because it encourages them to learn what they need to know for the rotation and they can apply it the next day. Yeah. So I think giving them something specific to read up on and then and then making sure you follow up because just giving, a, you know, maybe you don't like the students, so you send them off to do a bunch of busy work and you just want them out of your way. Or, or maybe you really want them to learn and you want to encourage this. And I think that's the, that's the step you have to take to make it a useful process is to follow up on it the next day. Other thoughts? Yeah, James. So I think most of us in radiology will, maybe if there's an extra station, you know, have the student, like we'll log in and have them look at the teaching cases and then write down what they think. So they're like getting the chance to make a judgment and actually sit in our chair sort of thing. And I've done it where I've had them just like type for me what they think this chest x-ray means or whatever. And it's, the experience changes. It turns into a fun, sort of not sleepy experience. It makes it <laughs> interactive. So, I mean, just like if there's any way that you could give them a small part of your job that's not the scut work, like fax this to social worker or whatever stuff. Like they, they need to do that stuff too, I think, but they need to do some of the stuff that we do closely. You know, we can set them free or we can you know, be nearby. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, you know, I, I, I've done that for years, and I love doing that. I give them the opportunity to independently look at something, come up with their own conclusion, because I, I think sometimes we butt in too much, and, and they need a chance to sort of evaluate it on their own. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll we'll move on here. Next uh, item. So independent learning. Uh, you know, this is more for uh, elementary school, but I, I found my wife is on the school board for you know. Uh, Mesa School District, and I'm in sort of undergraduate medical education, and there's a lot of overlap between these areas. So I think these uh, apply here, giving people's choices so they can reflect on their own interests and preferences, encouraging group work, um, co collaborate with pupils to set shared learning goals, involve pupils in lesson planning, uh, editing between, yeah, anyway. All right, resident evaluations from students uh, participate actively in patient care. Encouragement to participate actively in patient care. How do, you, how do you guys do that? How do you encourage them to actively participate? Because I know that see Valley Wise, it's a, it's a little limited what the student can do on the electronic medical record, correct? Is that right? So, so how are you guys going about actively helping them be involved in patient care? Yeah, uh, Joyce, people, we have really good people to Here, what we'll have them do, especially like in clinic, if it's someone that's coming in for like a well woman exam, so it's not like we have to get our hand in on there to get an idea of like how big is the nurse, how are we going to get this out with surgery. I'll be like, show me how you're going to do a pelvic exam, show me how you're going to do a speculum exam, and then we go in and do that. And I tell them, like, you are the doctor, I'm your MA right now. I'm like, and you're the one that's going to be taking care of this patient, and they usually appreciate that. Some of them don't, they don't want to look at a vagina, but <laughs> <laughs> most of them. <laughs> But I like James's thought for radiology. Did you have, somebody raise their hand over here? I like James's thought of, of have them look at the images first, come up with their own conclusions. That gets them more active in a current case. Um, but but finding ways to make sure that they're actively involved. You know, I love I love now that CMS has allowed them to uh, document in the medical record because I think that is a, uh, a very relevant thing that they can be doing that will help patient care areas. Um, all right, so PEDS was uh, the high score there, and uh, how, how do you effectively get students involved? Let's see, traditional see patient and report, see one, do one, teach one. How do you guys like the see one, do one, teach one? Is that an effective way to get students involved? How many vote yes, definitely? No? It works for residents, because you've got to do them, but as a student, it, you know, some are a lot more comfortable pushing that needle in some arms. Yeah. Not that we ever would do that here. They would never, you know, do a procedure here. Anybody got a problem with that method? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who wants to be the first one the student pokes that needle into? <laughs> Anybody want to be the first one? Volunteers? 
No, but somebody has to be. Yes. Yeah, so, or do they? Well, that's where the whole sim thing is. Yes. I think simulation is a good answer to that. You're right. After you do all the simulation and that, you still have to have a first one. But I, but I think simulation needs to be used in a lot of these areas before they actually touch a patient so that they're confident, they've proved competence in at least a simulated scenario or a task trainer that they can do the procedure before they do it. Then see one, do one, teach one is perfect, right? <laughs> there is no problem with doing that in simulation. Uh, but on a real patient, I, anybody ever been the first one somebody's done? I had a horrible experience. I had a, a, a epidural place for knee surgery. They wanted to let me watch it. You know, and this, this guy is like, he, he told me, he says, I'm an intern, never done one before. And I, in my mind, I thought, well, I was 25. I thought, it's gotta be easy, right? It's gotta be slam dunk. So I said, yeah, go ahead. And so he poked and he poked and he poked and he never got it in. And, and finally, I said, hey, could you go get your attending? <laughs> and uh, anybody you guys send it one stick. Um, yeah, I wish he would practiced on a simulator before he stuck me, right? Because he was, I, I almost think that hurt worse than the knee surgery. You know, all the sticks that he made all around my spine. Uh, it's, it's not fun to be a first anything, really. But in the simulation lab, that's totally perfect. Let's see, uh, science specific tasks and follow up. I think that's been a theme so far, right? The follow up part is, is really key. Um, any other thoughts? I think we had a good discussion there. Okay, our next one is uh, listening. Let's see, modeled effective patient care. Uh, yeah, <laughs> are you good at what you do is what they're saying, right? <laughs> and universally, they think you are pretty good. You know, they really you can see the scores there. It's probably our highest category. Uh, they do admire you guys and think you're doing a good job. But I mean, you do have to be an example of all the other things you've, you've been talking about. Uh, and, and this is evidence of that. Okay. Uh, we are role models, even if we don't. Charles Barkley, not a role model, right? Uh, there's some bad role models out there, obviously. <laughs> That's our <not> strong. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, we, and we've talked a little bit about this. Um, tell them, show them, let them experience, let them teach something. The, the C1, D1, teach one, but in, in an appropriate setting, I think that's, uh, that's okay. You know, I, th I thought I'd show an example of this. I know nothing about halibut fishing, but I went halibut fishing, you know. And, and <laughs> somebody there to show us, you know, and then let us experience ourselves and then, and then help somebody else learn within a short time. So we first went uh, uh, bait fishing. That was the best fishing I've ever done in my whole life. We had six hooks on a line. You'd pull up four or five or six every time. It was, it was awesome. We thought we were done. We're so happy that we caught the fish, you know, we're, but that was just the beginning. You know, we're gonna take these and use these as bait to catch the halibut, which, uh, you know, within a short time. Anybody ever done halibut fishing? Have ever done it? Yeah. So, so you go out in the ocean, big huge weight on the end of it. Where'd you go? So, dime a dozen, huh? Yeah. How big is the biggest one you ever caught? 180 pounds. I mean, here's, here's the, the rule is you can't keep a halibut unless it's smaller than 44 inches long. You can't keep them between 44 and 72 because those are the moms and dads. So they'll let you keep those. You can keep them if it's bigger than 72 inches long. But you can't. <laughs> so you, you get this, it, this line with a one or two pound weight on the end of it, this huge hook. You put a couple of fish on the end of the hook and you drop it down to the bottom of the ocean and you, you feel the bounce of the weight off the bottom of the ocean. You can feel it. And then you get a tug. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> you pull up these gigantic fish uh, from the bottom of the ocean uh, pretty consistently. So there's, you know, we. In, in one day, we all learned how to help the fish, and it was uh, pretty successful. So, I think uh, it was uh, a. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. I think this might be our last one. Uh, promoted positive and constructive learning environment. And this is one we want to spend a little time on uh, because sometimes our students perceive that we don't provide a positive learning environment. Why might why might a student not feel like the learning environment in your department is positive? What might be some reasons? Well, in surgery, sometimes it's a stressful environment. It can, it can be, be stressful. Yeah, it can be stressful. They're seeing 
you know, maybe patients not at their best, maybe uh, other staff and physicians not at their best because it's stressful. Okay, very good. So a lot of times um, they've been delivering it such a vulnerable situation for all patients so that um, they're not able to really get the yeah, I, I remember being on OBGYN and, and the woman would say, I don't want a man. So as I excluded, I feel bad. <laughs> what do you think, James? Uh, I think all of us, like our jobs are extremely stressful, like you're saying, but with healthcare in general, nurses and everybody, like as long as I've known, people talk about patients in like a coping sort of way, like, oh, that guy, he really smells, or whatever. Like, they're mm -hmm. just like, you kind of deal with the stress by making jokes or doing something that, you know, may not be so appropriate. And students may be like... Students are hypersensitive to those comments, yeah. really hypersensitive. We get them all the time in our evaluations. If you say something unkind, these sweet Jesuit students, they, <laughs> I, really, I'm serious. They, they pick up on it immediately. You, you know, they, they, no joke, no joke. I mean, this is what we're, <laughs> I mean, they are sensitive to these things. And, and I think realizing that is helpful. I think that's a, that's a great point. Uh, we need to realize that, hey, these students may not be used to the way we deal with stress. And maybe the way we deal with stress may not be the best anyway, right? Uh, so I think, I think those are great points. Other reasons, they may not think your learning environment is positive. Yes, <clears throat> from my experience as a medical student, I would say the area is where I never really felt like if it was disrespectful or harassing or whatever, it was just like people didn't care that I was there or not. That was probably the biggest thing for me. Just apathy, it makes it not a pot. I, I think you're right, it, being ignored, and maybe there's a reason they're, they're being ignored sometimes, but not all the time, right? I, I think there is, there, there can be a tendency just to ignore the student. I gotta do what I gotta do and I can't have you know, be bothered with this. But, but that's part of our job to teach. It's part of your job as a resident at either Maricopa or St. Or Valley Wise or St. Joe's to teach. That is part of your job. Um, and so we need to realize that. And, and, and there are gonna be times when, hey, we can't <laughs> deal with the student right now. We gotta deal with this crash C-section or whatever it is. Uh, and I think the students understand that. But just being ignored uh, gets old really fast and does create a, a negative learning environment. You, you mentioned something else that you said didn't bother you that much, but being humiliated. They are very sensitive to this being humiliated. And I, <laughs> what do you guys think of that? Humiliated. What? What did you say about being sensitive? Humiliated. 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 Yeah, we try to not humiliate them. Yeah. We are like, I think everyone at one point or another has experienced that. You, you want to do your best to avoid making anyone feel that way if you've ever had that experience. Every year, though, we get students who say they feel humiliated. Why? Why do you think they feel that way? And, and this is all I conjecture. Like maybe someone, if you could just like give them feedback in front of someone else by just pulling them aside, that would be very humiliating. Right. Um, so I think. Most of the time, at least when I try to give feedback by myself with the student or like to pull them off the side, something happened, I'll be like, hey, like in the future, you know, maybe like talk to the patient before you like go on your physical exam or do something like or don't say wow in the middle of the delivery. You're like, oh my God, like try to hold that back, you know. And but you don't like obviously do that in front of you when you leave them alone. You try to pull them aside and try to make it less traumatizing for them. Good. Good, yeah, James. I think we kind of our age group, most of us straddles this like older generation where that stuff was just accepted and you can say whatever you want to anybody and it kind of, you know, I know I'm judging or I'm like generalizing, but and then maybe a little bit younger generation where more ultra sensitive, more, you know, I don't know, whatever, some, somebody said something over there, but, but basically we just need to take keep that in mind. like. Something that we would have said to somebody that's our peer, our peer, like we wouldn't necessarily be able to get away with with somebody who maybe is more sensitive. Because yeah. they're supposed to be objective, not emotional, but because we're humans that are emotional, so there's going to be some emotion attached to whatever we say. 
Yeah, and I, and, and I agree with all of these thoughts. Do you think there's a, a way to create an environment, though, that even when, you know, something happens and you, uh, you sort of tell them that they messed up, it's still okay? And I think it's, it's preparing for that. It's creating the a positive learning environment so that you could say, so, uh, James, have I ever said something negative to a resident in a conference? Have I ever made fun of anybody? Uh, I, think so. yeah. I have. I fully confess, I, I have. Myself. I've made fun of residents before. Do you feel bad? No. But no you're, not learning. You don't, you're, not, you're not a judgmental person. Like, you're a kind person. Because hopefully, hopefully we've created an environment where we can tease somebody a little bit, and it's okay. Now, obviously, we're not gonna call them a name or you know do something offensive, but to tease a little bit. If you've created an environment where it's positive, maybe that's okay. And I'm not endorsing teasing people. I'm not trying to say that, but but you can create an environment that's fun and that's interactive and that can't where you can tease each other occasionally, and it's it's okay. Sandy Hornstein was the best at this. He was the master at it. I, I, he created uh, Dan Gridley. Did did, uh, did Sandy Ornstein ever tease you? Uh, every ten to fifteen seconds. <laughs> me, did you ever feel bad when he teased you? Never once. Love the environment. Why not? It, because he created a good environment where it was okay it was to make mistakes. Yeah, that's where you learn. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That is the environment. Is, how many of you hope that that's the environment you're creating? No. Yeah, positive, where you can have interaction. I mean, we're not endorsing, making fun of people. I'm not trying to say that, but but that you can have an interactive sort of uh, environment where people can learn and feel comfortable making a mistake. And that's really what, what this is about, right? People are going to make mistakes. And how do we deal with it when they do make a mistake? You know, we can be objective and tell them what they've done. Uh, and I think hopefully if it's a positive environment overall, they can still handle that negative feedback and it's still okay. And that, that's hopefully what we're developing and working on. I, I do think the comments about people being sensitive is, is probably true. Um, they, they probably are a little sensitive and a lot of times when they're humiliated, it's just that they were told they got something wrong, right, in front of other people. And I love your idea of, hey, pull them aside. If something really embarrassing, pull them aside so it's not in front of the family and the other residents and the other students and, and let, give them feedback. I think that's a good way to go about it. Let's see what Elder has. So we asked a question, how can we best uh, promote respect, encourage open dialogue, set clear objectives? You know, and I, I think that setting clear objectives is helpful as well. Um, it, has anybody ever felt like you've been evaluated and you're never told what you were being evaluated on? Anybody, that happened to anybody? <laughs> you get evaluated, but they never told you what they were gonna use to evaluate you. And I think that's not, Hopefully that's not happening, but I, I don't think that's that uncommon. You know, the first time you find out what you're being evaluated on is when they sit down and give you feedback. That's frustrating. That creates an environment that's not positive, I think. Uh, discuss expectations, kind of the same idea. So this po uh, creating a positive learning environment, you know, encourage open dialogue. I think that open dialogue is key. Get people talking to each other, and, and I think that's helpful. It's the whole idea behind the not the stand up here and talk sort of method, but where we, uh, you know, case-based learning uh, idea where we're, we're interacting more. Uh, set objectives, student expectations, promote respect in all situations. And I think we, we do that pretty well in radiology sometimes. Uh, one more, let's see, uh, effective teacher. I think this is a this is kind of a pretty subjective question, right? Or were they an effective teacher, knowledgeable, positive attitude, enthusiastic? What what creates an effective teacher? Think about the teachers that you thought were good teachers. What did they do? Yeah. I feel like they were as a medical student, they were just inclusive. Inclusive. Like, yeah. They included their conversations and their stuff so that we can actually get our role. It, getting people involved in what's going on. Yeah, yeah, James. One of the better teaching methods is like letting them like self discovery kind of. So, like, you do some encounter or whatever, and you're like, well, how do you think that went? Mm -hmm. Or, like, 
what do you think are things that you did well in that thing and kind of help them figure out what they did and then they probably are already feeling bad about the thing that you are going to tell them that they did wrong. <laughs> like they probably have right. enough self-awareness most people that they know what they did so it's easier if they can kind of say it and verbalize it and then it's like, like yeah I, I noticed that too but what's something you can do next time that would change that or whatever so just completely just facilitating their own self-discoveries absolutely much better to let them pull out any issues that were went wrong because they probably do know and if they don't know is that important for you to know that they didn't know that they totally blew this case they thought that was awesome you know <laughs> uh yeah it's probably important too as, as as where they are in their you know journey to learn whatever material they're learning they, they don't even know that they didn't know well that that's important right uh but the, the worst kind of wrong to me is confidently wrong right <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident about this, and, and you're wrong. That's bad, right? Uh, but the not knowing that you're wrong. Uh, other other issues, other things that people do that you can think of that make somebody an effective teacher? Yes. So I'm a medical student still, and something that I've seen is when they're enthusiastic about what they do. It's fun to learn from people who love what they do, isn't it? Absolutely. I think. I almost tease people a little bit that the best teachers are a little crazy, you know, they because they really love what they do. They get really excited about it. And, uh, I think that's true. It's fun to learn for people who love what they do. Um, and so, yeah, from, from your own perspective and your own specialty, hopefully you love what you're doing, and, and that will rub off on others. I think that's a great point. Um, other thoughts, things that people do that you really like that helped you learn? Let's see what we have here. Yeah, so enthusiasm was definitely one of them. Availability, role model, clinical competence, are you good at what you do? Uh, Non-judgmental. So top five from the survey from residents, those were those are the top five. Were they really good at what they do? Non-judgmental, role model, availability. Let's see, clinical competence. Now sometimes students have un <laughs> unrealistic expectations, right? You know, Mr. Smith, I just want to know that I'm an abstract sequential learner and trust that you'll conduct yourself accordingly. Um, well, you know, uh, <laughs> that might be hard. So high standards, be a good learner in your area, study, your, uh, know of your expertise. Okay, a safe environment. And this is where, you know, we want to make sure we're careful, uh, able to admit mistakes. Um, one, of, one of my best mentors, a guy named Richard Webb, told me, Randy, people will learn far more when you share your mistakes than your successes. I think that's, that's absolutely true. We have to be able to admit and, and face our own mistakes. You know, obviously there's legal issues involved sometimes, but, uh, but we, we do need to own up that we make mistakes. And this whole medical error thing, if it was routine that we would, you know, sort of be open about it, it legal issues wouldn't be nearly as bad as they are. It's when you try and hide something that real problems uh, occur. Um, the fear of retribution, yeah. Fear of retribution. Uh, it's been long enough that I could share what happened. With it. So <laughs> we we had a we had a, a chair of a department. We won't say which department that that had a real issue with this on the ACGME survey. Uh, I think eighty percent of the residents said we fear that if we bring up a mistake, that there'll be retribution. Um, and, and how do you think this particular leader dealt with it? It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. So it wasn't funny. It was really sad, actually. <laughs> he had a meeting together. <laughs> Close. He had a meeting. What? Well, I mean, what would a normal person do? Yeah. There, obviously, either, whether it's a perception thing or reality, there's a problem here. And I, I got to figure out how to fix this. You know, maybe apologize, say, I'm sorry that you perceive this. You know, there's a variety of, of appropriate ways to go about doing this. But this is what this person said, word for word. He said, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> so, I couldn't believe he said that. Like, okay, you're reinforcing this whole idea that there will be retribution if you ever do this again. I mean, obviously, that would not be the optimal way of going about doing this. That's true. It could be. It could be. So, uh, okay. 
some uh, enthusiastic. Everybody knows the story of Huckleberry Finn, right? Uh, we tried it. One, one day, here's, here's my son. This is a real story. That's my boy uh, in San Antonio, Texas, when he lived there. I told him we we're going to go out and pull weeds. And this was <laughs> this is how he felt. He was not real happy about it. And I, when I, and I pulled out the story of Huckleberry Finn, I said, remember that story? And uh, he said, let's, I said, let's try it. Because we saw his friend Denver, is his name, right down the street. And I uh, said, let's try it. Let's act like we're having a great time pulling weeds and see if we can get Denver to come over here and help us. And uh, it worked. <laughs> it worked. Denver came by and he started pulling weeds with us. He thought it was really fun. Uh, I think if you're enthusiastic about things, even really you know, jobs that are really distasteful and no fun can be made to be tolerable, right? Uh, radiology is too easy for radiology. What's this a picture of? What's the diagnosis here? Yes, <laughs> yes. This is uh, every medical student's dream, right? A little disimpacted here. This is the largest amount of stool I think I've ever seen in Val here, but uh, you know, we're enthusiastic about it. Maybe people can uh, get on board with us. Okay, uh, you can teach anything anywhere. Let's uh, let's try this. We'll do one case here. And the whole idea is, a lot of people think you have to have the perfect situation, place, time to, to teach. And I think that's wrong. I think you can teach small things anywhere. Limited number of, of objectives you're trying to get across is actually better. If there's only one or two learning objectives, that's optimal. If you have 10 learning objectives, uh, the likelihood of people are going to remember that are small. So let's see. We've got no pediatricians in the room, right? Um, well, you guys discuss it amongst yourself. Tell me, uh, discuss what the diagnosis is here. Go ahead. a fracture? Raise your hand. How many can name that fracture? <laughs> name that fracture. James can name that fracture. Right? Tell me your name. Charles. Charles, what's the fracture? The lateral condylar. Lateral condylar fracture. That's right. And, and it's important because there's a much more common fracture over here, you first years. What's the more common fracture? Nick, do you have any idea what the more common fracture is in a younger child elbow injury? It's okay if you know. I don't expect you to know. No. Second year, second year resident, radiology resident. <laughs> What's it? No. Nurse maid? That that is a more common. That you're right, but it's not no. a fraction. No. So, so there's there's three three bones that can be typically uh, fractured here: proximal radius, ulna, or distal humerus. In a younger child, which of those three is the typical one to break? Super condylar. You guys know too much. Yeah, super condylar. So that's the more common fracture, and, and that one will, will typically heal okay if it's not displaced. Uh, but this one requires surgery, and they look a lot alike. Here, I show, I'll show you a supracondylar fracture. It, it looks very similar, right? Joint effusion, fracture across the distal humerus. But why is it so, so different and so important that we identify a lateral condylar fracture versus a supracondylar fracture? I don't want you guys to answer. How about some junior radiology residents? What's that? They, they do have growth plates, and this that is the right answer. These are, these are going into the growth plate, and it's a, one of those Salter Harris fractures. Is this one, two, three, four, five? It's kind of, it's kind, it is a, it, there is a three component to it. It goes through the epiphysis, but it also goes through the metaphysis, so it's a four. And because it's a four, that's so three. It's an unstable fracture. It's a, it's it's unstable, and there's an attachment site there that tugs on it and won't allow it to heal. And so they got to put a screw or a pin in that to make sure it heals. So 
in just a very short time, you learned a little bit about lateral condylar fractures, right? It didn't take us a ton of time, but you can do that in a lot of areas with students. One or two at teaching points that are, that are helpful to them. They'll be helpful later on. And I love the book, Make It Stick. Anybody read that book, Make It Stick? Oh, it's a great book. Um, their point, their main, one of their main points is that, okay, you've taught something. It's best if you quiz them on it. And, and as we, we've talked about a whole bunch today, follow up, right? We talked about it last week, uh, Nick. Why is a lateral condylar fracture different from a supracondylar fracture? So repetitive quizzing at intervals is a really helpful way to make it stick. So following up on these things makes it helpful to them. And I think uh, one of the things we do, uh, one of my favorite things we do every year is we go radiology, pediatric radiology, A to Z. We have these little lectures and it's just kind of a reminder of the things hopefully that we've, we've studied that year. But regular quizzing, regular testing uh, is actually a very helpful tool to making it stick. All right, I think we're about done here. Other ways, just I, I wanted to throw out a few more things on ways to improve uh, learning environment. Um, if you go a whole rotation or a whole day with somebody and you don't know their name, I do this with my son all the time because he's learned how to drive. He's gonna go get his thing. So if you do something wrong, I just say fail. You know, because he knows it's fail. If you haven't learned their name at the end of the day, fail, right? You failed as a teacher. Uh, uh, invite questions, listen to them. And I think this idea of respecting answers and opinions, not ridiculing, belittling, intimidating learners, and then uh, admit your own knowledge deficits. I think sometimes we're, we set ourselves up to be perfect, and, and none of this is perfect, right? We are going to have our own knowledge deficits. We can take things only to a certain point, and then we don't maybe know more beyond that. And I think it's okay to admit that, and then uh, invite them, learn together, learn together. I think Googling something together is a great way to sit and learn. Um, all right, you're trained now. Go out and teach, teach students. Hopefully, um, you think about this. And one of, the, one of the things I love that we do now is we give uh, CME, we don't give resident CME, but we give attending CME not for teaching, but for improving the way they teach. So if you sit down and you think of a better way to teach, and you document that and you go out and fill out a little form, we'll give you uh, two hours for every one hour you teach. We want, we want to in, encourage improving. And I think as residents, think about it. Think, be, be thoughtful about what you're doing with the student. Know what the goals and objectives are for, for your rotation. Tell them at the beginning of the rotation, hey, we're going to work together this week or we're going to work together today. Then today, I'll give you feedback on how I think you're doing. I mean, start thinking about it, and, I, and you'll see that you improve dramatically in your teaching with a little thought. We appreciate all you do for our students. They love you. You guys do a great job. We recognize that. Your, your evaluations are off the charts high. I mean, you're almost perfect for scores on everybody. Uh, we, we recognize you're doing a good job. But think about how you can even improve what you're doing. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to make sure to remind everyone that you stand in. All right, let's go. <laughs>